This is a long study, so the scripture reading of Mark chapter 12 verses 13 to 44 has been omitted. Now I'm going to sit down to talk to you tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, It's more informal, but the Lord Jesus used to do this, and in fact in the synagogue the rabbi always sat to preach. I think that's a great idea, which has not been carried through into the Christian church. Maybe in our new church we can arrange something. Well now, having been to a boxing match recently with one or two others in this room, I want to begin by saying that this chapter 12 represents round one. Our Lord has laid down a challenge and said, come out and do your worst. I'm ready for you now. He has literally thrown down the glove. And they are going to come out and they are going to fight him with everything they've got. But just as at the beginning of a physical fight, there's a kind of sparring goes on. And maybe in round one, there aren't many severe blows. uh, Assessing one another, weighing each other up, trying to get the measure of the opponent. You get the same thing in the last week in the life of our Lord. It's in the last round when we come to chapter 15 that the great blow is struck. But this first round is largely a round of words. They are fighting only with words at the moment. Our Lord has challenged them. They've come out and they challenge him. Sticks and stones hurt your bones, but names don't hurt at all, was a proverb I was brought up on. But in fact, words can hurt much more than sticks and stones. They can cut very deep. And in fact, words were the first weapons used by our Lord's enemies. Now once again, to follow through the picture of the boxing match, the two things that a man in the ring wants to do before he gets much further are these. First, he wants to get the crowd on his side. There are a lot of people watching. And if he can get the sympathy of the crowd and the cheers of the crowd, then this will help him. It will help his morale. It will help him in the fight. But secondly, he wants also to get the attention of the referee and the judges. He wants to get a verdict for himself. Now, you, in exactly the same way, you get the impression that the enemies of our Lord, the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, priests, elders, they all, they all team up against him, even including the Herodians. They're all one against him. The two things they're aiming at in this verbal battle, round one, are first, to discredit him in the eyes of the public and get the crowd on their side. That's the first thing. And second, to try and get a charge with which they can accuse him to the proper authorities, the judge, Pontius Pilate in this case. And everything they say to him has this double object to get the public against him and to get the authorities, the judges, against him. And they have some pretty cute questions worked out which seem at first sight to force our Lord either to lose the public or to fall foul of the authorities. And that's what they're after. Now there are six little conversations in the passage I've read And they go into two groups of threes. The first three are all defense on the part of Jesus. And just as in, again, a boxing fight, I don't know why I keep going back to this, but it's a very good illustration. In round one, one of them begins to uh, take the initiative and try and uh, land a a good right. And and one begins to uh, fight out. And then... The fight swings and the other person takes the initiative. Now in the first three questions raised in chapter 12, Jesus is on the defense. He's on the defensive. They are attacking him. And three questions come which are blows and very sharp ones. But not one of them gets home. Then in the second half of the passage we have three more conversations in which Jesus now comes to the attack and delivers three telling sayings to them. Let's take the first. The first question is a political one. 
And the people involved are the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now they make strange bedfellows. Normally they wouldn't speak to each other. The Herodians were not Jews. They were political puppets in the hands of the Romans. They belonged to the hated line of Esau. They were Edomites. And the Herodians were hated by the Jews because the Romans had set the Herodians over them. The Pharisees were about the most exclusive religious people in the whole land. And to see exclusive religious people who normally say politics is a terribly dirty business and have nothing to do with it, lining up with Herodians who are just up to their eyes in dirty politics is an amazing coalition. And here they are together. And when we read the scripture carefully, we find that somebody else put them both up to it. It says they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. It's an incredible intrigue. And it simply shows that when people hate God, they will make the most incredible alliances with one another. So they, the priests, set up the Pharisees and the Herodians and said, now here's a trick question, go and try it out on him. I remember at school, two large schoolboys got a little boy um, and uh, said, which one of us do you like best? <laughs> and these two big bullies had this poor little lad right in the middle. There was nothing he could say. If he said you, the other one was going to beat him up. If he said you, this one would. Now, it is precisely that kind of question that they'd managed to think up. See, the Pharisees represented the Jewish side and the Jewish feelings. The Herodians represented the Roman feelings. And the question was bound to offend one or the other in its answer. And the question was a most offensive one. I want you to imagine that um, when John Blanchard gets to Czechoslovakia, that somebody gets him up in the public square in Prague in front of a large crowd and says, Now, what do you think about the Russians? So now that's the kind of situation. Should we do what the Russians tell us? Now if John Blanchard said yes, he would lose the sympathy of all the Czechoslovakians. If he said no, he'll be in a Russian jail pronto. You see the kind of situation. I use that because Czechoslovakia is an occupied country. So was Israel at this time. The Romans were an enemy power. And it's just that situation, and it seems an appalling trap. You see, either he'll say, no, we shouldn't pay these taxes to Rome and let this money go out of the country to Rome and to the Caesar, in which case they can accuse him to Pilate straight away. He's a traitor. Or he says, uh, yes, we should, in which case he'd be so unpopular with the people that that would be the end of his public ministry. It's a brilliant question. But my advice to anyone is, never try and get the better of Jesus. Many people have tried and nobody's ever done it. Never try and be too clever for him. Jesus saw straight through their question, they weren't bothered about taxes at all. It says he saw their hypocrisy, and that means they didn't want an answer, they just wanted to trap him. And so he saw straight through it and he said, why do you ask? Why? And since presumably they didn't answer, he went on to give them an answer. And it's a brilliant answer. Now he said, can you give me a coin? Somebody give me a coin. Now I've heard it said that Jesus was so poor he had to ask someone to give him a coin. I don't think that's the reason he asked for one. Because Judas had some money. There was a treasurer for the disciples and he could have said, uh, give me one of our coins, Judas. But he didn't. Why did he say, you give me one of your coins? Because he wanted something out of their pockets. Something that they are already using. Something to which they have already committed themselves. And he says, give me some money out of your pocket. You know, the little boy who said, you know, whose subscription is this? <laughs> That's not what he said. He said, now, here is the money you're using. You will use this money and you accept it at its face value. You buy your food with it and your clothes with it. Whose money is it? In other words, you are already committed 
you're already involved. And it's a very clever answer. But going a little further than this, and here is something that isn't in the Bible, but will help you to understand. In AD 6, Jerusalem was under Herod's son Archelaus, who was a thoroughly bad lot. And they got so fed up with him that they petitioned Rome, Rome who had put Archelaus on the throne and Herod his father before him, that's the Herod who killed the babies at Bethlehem, they petitioned Rome and said, please, can we have a Roman governor instead of Archelaus? Even a Roman governor would be better than this man. And they had actually asked the Romans to come. They needn't have had a Roman governor at all. And when the Roman governor came, he introduced Roman coins. And he introduced Roman taxes. And many another thing. And our Lord is virtually saying to them, you asked for them. You were quite happy to have them then, and you were quite happy to use their coins when they came. You are already committed, you are already getting the benefits of the Roman rule. And therefore you have a duty to pay for the benefits you're getting. Now, I'm afraid that too many of us think of taxes and rates and other things as almost something that's uh, extortion, you know, that some criminals up in Whitehall take from us. You'll pardon my mentioning this, but um, uh, it's a good plug for you. <laughs> but as, as if, you know, it's, it's all going into someone's pocket and as if it's a gigantic criminal act and therefore the only moral thing to do is to evade as much as possible. But in fact, that money goes to provide education, to provide defence, to provide security, to provide the social services. Our rates go to empty the dustbin. It's not extortion. You are getting benefits. And in fact, if the government said, all right, from now on we won't do a thing for anybody, and if the council said we won't do a thing for anybody, you're on your own from now on, you'd be spending half your days going around trying to find someone to empty your dustbin. And you'd be wandering around the streets with a torch at night. In fact, God has ordained that we should live together in a community, in a state, in a nation, under a government. And for the benefits of that government, we, we have to pay. And the very coins we use bear on, it, on them the image of an earthly sovereign who has rights over us and whom we acknowledge. So Jesus was just saying, you benefit from this, you ask them to come, you've benefited from their control, then you need to pay for that. Somebody's got to pay for it, and the ones who get the benefit from it should do. And you notice, they said, should we pay taxes or not? But he said, render to Caesar. And the word render means repay. It means to give something that you owe. So they said, should we pay taxes? He said, you should repay taxes. That's a different matter altogether. Now this puts it all in a very different light. And of course they couldn't say anything about this because they had benefited from the Roman peace, the Pax Romana, that brought security to the whole Mediterranean world and brought an absence of war for many years and brought a situation in which you could travel all around the Mediterranean without a passport and protected by Rome. But then, having defended that, he now goes on to something more. And he says, also, you have a duty to God for the benefits you get from God. And God has a right to expect something from you as well as Caesar. And therefore, a Christian is in a double kind of citizenship. He's a citizen of earth and owes certain things to the earthly kingdom to which he belongs and he's a citizen of heaven and owes certain things to the kingdom of heaven to which he belongs. The problem only arises for a Christian when Caesar begins to claim something that only God can claim and then you've got a real problem and then the Christian has to say no I can't give it to you. There came a day when Caesar said I am God you must now worship me as Lord and the Christian said, now that is something that isn't yours, and we can't give it. And we'd rather go to the lions than give it. But in this case, it was a simple issue. 
Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You're using his money. Why shouldn't you give him his money? If you really want to be logical, you shouldn't touch his money. And of course, that was a real dig at the priests because they were fairly wealthy and they were rather fond of the Roman shekels. And then give to God's what is God's. Now then, I should use the money, therefore, that I have with an earthly sovereign on it, the image. I'm sorry, I've forgotten to bring my Roman penny, and indeed the mite. But you see, there, there's the image of Queen Elizabeth. I'm using her money. She has a claim on it. Now then, what has God's image on it? The answer is every man and woman on earth. And the thing that I must render to God that he deserves is me. If that bears the image of an earthly king and therefore the earthly king has a right to it, I'm made in the image of a heavenly king and he has a right to me. And this is what Jesus is saying. And he turns it very cleverly back on them and says, is God getting from you what God should have from you? That's the biggest question. Pharisees and Herodians retire. The bell rings and round one is over. It's a very wonderful exchange. Now the second round is concerned not with a political question but a philosophical one. And now come the Sadducees. They are the wealthy aristocratic uh, priests of Jerusalem. They run the temple. They get most of the money from it. They are somewhat anti-supernatural in their views. They would be called the liberals of their day. And in particular, they said the only real bit of the Bible that we take notice of are the first five books. The Law of Moses, the Pentateuch as it was called, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You had to prove a thing from those five books before they'd believe it. And one of their strange views was that they didn't believe in a personal afterlife. And uh, just to help you to remember this, that is why they were sad, you see. They just didn't believe in anything in the future. The Pharisees did. And so a Pharisee could say, far I see, into the future. And this is just a very easy tag to remember the main difference between them as far as their beliefs go. The Pharisees had a real belief in the afterlife. The Sadducees just didn't believe it. They believed that you lived on in other people's memory and in the good that you'd done, which is what a lot of British people seem to believe about the future. They didn't believe that you lived on. And therefore, one idea which the Pharisees held, which the Sadducees didn't, was the resurrection of the body. That in fact, a person comes back to life again with a body. And they didn't believe this at all. Now they came along to Jesus and this was another verbal battle between them. And this time they were trying to get him discredited in the eyes of the public by making him look silly. Some people love to do this. We've had some sessions up at the uh, university in the last few months and uh, I could pick out the students who just wanted to do this. They had their clever questions. They didn't want to know the answer. They just wanted to make the speaker look silly in front of the others. And if you can make a, a speaker look utterly silly, then of course he's not going to have any effect on them. So the Sadducees came with a very funny question. Now in the book of Deuteronomy, which they did accept, there was a law that if a man died without children, his brother had to marry his widow and produce a child for him and uh, so on down the line. And the reason was twofold. The land was divided up and a parcel of land was given to a family forever. And therefore the family name must be kept alive and there must be a continuity to the family to keep that land. And it was uh, God's law that when the land was so tied to families that this family name be kept alive this way. Now here was their question. It's not a living issue really, it's one of these um, logical puzzles. And uh, they said this man died, he had no children, his brother took his wife, he had none, his brother took his wife, he had none, seven times down the line. Now they said there's going to be an awful situation in heaven because all these seven men are going to fight over this woman and say, she's my wife, she's my wife, she's my wife. 
Now, if you think this is a, a silly question, let me put it to you in the form in which it has been most often put to me. The same basic question, I have often had it in my ministry. And this is how it's been put to me. People have said to me, how could I ever be happy in heaven if any of my family were in hell? Now that's how the question is put to me. And it's the same basic question. Deep down, it's the same principle. And the answer Jesus gave is the same answer to both questions. So before we dismiss the Sadducees too lightly, realize that it is a problem. And the basic problem to people is this. They can't imagine how heaven can be different from earth. That's the basic problem. And imagine that everything we know here will be the same there, including our relationships. And we're told quite simply they will not be. That heaven is different in many ways. Now Jesus tackled them head on and he said, now you've asked the wrong question. Or if you had known the right answer, you wouldn't have asked that question. He says, you are ignorant of two very important things. You're ignorant first of the Bible and so many of our trick questions show an ignorance of this book because this book I'm more and more impressed with the fact that the more I read it the more every question is answered and ignorance of the Bible is one sure way of getting tied up in knots like these the second thing he says you don't know is you don't know the power of God meaning the power of God to change things to make things different now he goes on to say, do you think that heaven will be just earth ad infinitum? Do you think that it'll just be continuing what you've got down here? The answer is it most certainly won't. Quite frankly, that wouldn't be heaven for most of us. Now that's not a reflection on my married life. <laughs> Please don't jump to conclusions. But um, for my wife to have to live with me as I am forever wouldn't be heaven. Um, and for all of us to have to live with each other forever as we are now wouldn't be heaven. But we believe in the power of God to change. And sometimes at a funeral when we've been burying someone who was known for being a bit awkward and, uh, you know, not everybody is ready for heaven when they die in the sense of being perfect, and most of us are not. I've said quite openly at the funeral, one of our hopes for the future is not just a glorified body, but a glorified character. The next time we meet so and so, they'll be perfect. And that's brightened up the relatives no end <laughs> and, and made something to look forward to. <laughs> but you see, the relatives will be perfect too if they die in Christ. In other words, life in heaven will be so different from life on earth. And the power of God to change things we need to remember. Now, the answer to the Sadducees' question was this you will not be husband and wife in heaven. When my wife and I got married, we didn't get married in a Mormon temple, quite deliberately. We got married in a Christian church. And we said, till death us do part. And we recognized that the particular relationship into which we entered on our marriage day was a relationship for this world only. That is not to say that we don't expect to be in heaven together, but when we get there, it will be a different relationship between us. If I can put it as I imagine it, it will be a relationship of brother and sister in Christ. We shall all be as closely related to each other. That will be an even more wonderful relationship than we could have known here. Now Jesus said that's how the angels live. The angels don't get married, nor do they reproduce and have children. They are created, each one. Incidentally, that's uh, the answer to those who feel that all life must come from evolution. You couldn't possibly believe in angels if you believe this. The angels were created distinctly, separately. They don't die. They don't grow old. They don't marry. They don't have children. And that is precisely what life will be like for us in heaven. Difficult though it is to imagine... And therefore the answer to those who've said to me, I won't be happy in heaven if all my relatives are not there, the answer is, all your relatives will be there. 
But the people you will count relatives there will not be the people you count relatives here. Our relationships will have changed. All your brothers and sisters in Christ will be there. And it's one of the things that God has the power to change, our relationships. Now lest that seem a callous thing to say or a hard thing to say, let me add straight away that as long as I am in this life, my physical relatives are my concern and my burden and my prayer. But in the next life the relationships are in Christ and those are the important relationships. And so they'd gone wrong because they didn't know their Bible well enough and they didn't know the power of God enough to change things. On the positive side, he said, now you Sadducees, you say you've got to prove a thing from the first five books of the Bible and where does it mention resurrection in the first five books of the Bible? He says, very simple, at the burning bush. When God appeared to Moses, he said this, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He did not say, I was the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's a very important difference. And perhaps you could read that story and never notice it. Now think of your father or your grandfather or your great-grandfather, someone who knew the Lord. Do you realize that God, if he spoke to you at this moment, would not say, I was the God of your great-grandfather. He would say to you, I am the God of your great-grandfather, which implies absolutely certainly your great-grandfather is still alive. I am the God of these people. In other words, they're still alive and I'm still their God. And you're just joining this wonderful company. And it's a tremendous thought, this. I remember going to Hebron and looking at the tomb, the cave of Machpelah, and the tombs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their three wives. And the centuries seemed to roll away to look at their graves. And yet as I stood there, I remember saying to myself aloud, I couldn't help it, they are not dead because God is still their God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Whatever's happened to their bodies, they are alive because he's alive. Could I put it this way? If you believe in a living God, then you must also believe that he is the God of the living. That's what Jesus says here. And so you said, you sees, you're sad and you shouldn't be. Now, round three. They're still on the attack. And now we come to a, a scriptural question. But this time the question is utterly sincere. It's wonderful in the discussion when somebody asks a question about a meaning of something in the Bible and really want to know and really are concerned about the truth. And there's been a scribe listening to all this. And in his mind he says, you know, that man knows the answers. That man knows what it's all about. I want to ask a question. Now, scribes in those days had long theological discussions. They greatly enjoyed it. Did the sort of thing you've been used to doing, David, recently. And they used to discuss two things. First of all, they used to add a lot of laws to the law of God, all the detailed application of it, what you could do and what you couldn't do on the Sabbath. That was one of their favorite discussions, what new laws they could make that would uh, help people to fulfill the Ten Commandments, you know. But the other sort of discussion they enjoyed having was this. They used to enjoy setting each other the question, can you summarize the law in one sentence? In fact, one rabbi said, uh, to his students, stand on one leg and summarize the whole law of God while you stand on one leg to try and make them condense it, abbreviate it, get it summed up in one little sentence. So now, this scribe comes to Jesus and asks him this question. If somebody asked you, he's saying to Jesus, what is the whole duty of man? What is the whole law of God? What is the summary of all that he wants from us? What would you say? <coughs> And our Lord quoted two texts, one from Deuteronomy, one from Leviticus, and he put them together. And he said, here it is. Love God with all your heart and mind and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's the whole lot. And he summed it all up in those two. 
Now, some people have said, well, Jesus was saying nothing new. There it is in the Old Testament. But there are at least two things that he was doing that was quite new. The first is nobody had ever put those two texts together before. Nobody. Nobody had ever thought of saying that love is the key to the law of God. Loving God, loving your neighbor, the two relationships, a cross will help you to think of them. And the other thing is that he didn't qualify the word neighbor. If you read Leviticus, your neighbor was your fellow Jew. But here it's as wide as the world. Furthermore, I'm going to say s some other things. Now, um, Roger Amos gave you a study of these two uh, commandments, I think, didn't you, uh, in February? Well, let me say some things that probably you said, but just to underline them. First of all, if you read this summary, you get the idea first that love is not feeling. The trouble is that nowadays, say the word love, and everybody thinks of bang, bang, bang down here, and think of emotion. And if you listen to the pop songs all about love, it's always about emotional love. But Christ makes it quite clear that real love is a response of the whole personality. <coughs> you can love people with all your heart, but you can also love them with all your mind. That's a notion you'll not find in a pop song. That your thoughts can love <coughs> And he summed it all up in those two. Now, some people have said, well, Jesus was saying nothing new. There it is in the Old Testament. But there are at least two things that he was doing that was quite new. The first is, nobody had ever put those two texts together before. Nobody. Nobody had ever thought of saying that love is the key to the law of God. Loving God, loving your neighbor, the two relationships, a cross will help you to think of them. And the other thing is that he didn't qualify the word neighbor. If you read Leviticus, your neighbor was your fellow Jew. But here it's as wide as the world. Furthermore, I'm going to say s some other things. Now, um, Roger Amos gave you a study of these two uh, commandments, I think, didn't you, uh, in February. Well, let me say some things that probably you said, but just to underline them. First of all, if you read this summary, you get the idea first that love is not feeling. The trouble is that nowadays, say the word love and everybody thinks of bang, bang, bang down here and think of emotion. And if you listen to the pop songs all about love, it's always about emotional love. But Christ makes it quite clear that real love is a response of the whole personality. <coughs> You can love people with all your heart, but you can also love them with all your mind. That's a notion you'll not find in a pop song. That your thoughts can love someone. You can love them with all your physical strength. That's a thought you'll not find. You can love them with all your soul. That's a thought you won't find. And what he's done is, is he's defined the word love as something that your whole personality is involved in. All your thinking, all your strength, all your heart and feeling and all your soul. It's, it's saying all of you. Furthermore, he's saying this, that before ever you love your neighbor, the first duty of a man is to love God. Now, this is what gives, I think, the lie to the idea that you'll find many more better Christians outside the church than in. You see, when anybody says to me, so-and-so is a good Christian and they don't go to church, I will say to them, now tell me why you think they're a good Christian. And the answer is invariably in terms of the second commandment here, because they love their neighbor. And one may then go on to say, do you think that person loves God? Because that comes first. Loving your neighbor is fine, it's good, it's part of the whole law. But it's the second thing, not the first. And I remember in one of our recent house crushes, a, a lady, was a lady who said, um, well, how can you love God? The only thing you can do is to love your neighbor. But Jesus said, loving God comes first. 
And in fact, I don't think you can really love your neighbor until you love God, not in the fullest sense. Mind you, I think that to love God without loving your neighbor is just as one-sided and just as much a caricature. So Jesus said, love is more than feelings. It's your whole personality. Love of God comes first. The next thing I want you to notice is this. If there is only one God, then he demands all your love. Did you notice the word one and the word all? Here, O Israel, there is only one God. Therefore, he has a right to all of you. Now, if you believed in a dozen gods, then you'd have to give each a twelfth of yourself. And that may sound a bit funny, but you know, this is what missionaries find. They go to a country where people believe in a whole lot of gods, and there they are, a whole row of idols, and they give a little bit to this, and a little bit to that, and a little bit to the other, and they have to dish out among all their gods what little resources they have. But you see, the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There is no other. Therefore, he has the right to all your heart, all your strength, all your thoughts, all your feelings, all of you. And that was something wonderful. I want you to notice, too, that it's all right to love yourself. That may sound a bit heretical, but let me say what I mean. He didn't say love your neighbor instead of yourself or in spite of yourself. He said as yourself. Meaning, it is perfectly valid to have a care of yourself. We are to care for our own bodies. They are temples of the Holy Ghost. To look after them properly. But he's saying you should take as much care of other people as you do of yourself. That's the standard. Anything that you would do for yourself, you should do for them. And that makes life very simple and yet very demanding. Now the scribe listened to all this and he said, you know, Jesus, you're right. You're absolutely right. This is the important thing. I can see this. Love is more important than all this religious ritual, all these sacrifices. The important thing is that we love God and love our neighbors. I can see this. And Jesus said to him, you know, you're very near. You're so near the kingdom of God. You're not far from it at all. Now, I wonder what would have brought that man right in. He wasn't right there in saying, I can see that it's love. What would have brought him right through? The answer is very simple. Two things. First, the acknowledgement that he had not done either of those two things. That's the first step. Once you realize what God has a right to expect of your life, the first step towards the kingdom is the step of repentance. Lord, I have not loved you with all my heart and soul and strength. Lord, I have not loved my neighbor. In other words, the first step is to realize we haven't done what God wanted us. Step number two into the kingdom is to say, Lord, even if you forgive me not doing this, I will never be able to do them in the future without your help. That's faith. That would have brought him right into the kingdom. He could see what was needed. But so far as we know, he didn't admit that he did need this and he didn't admit that he couldn't do it by himself. But he was very near to the kingdom and a man as sincere as that is very near. And from then on, nobody asked Jesus any questions. Well, who would after that? He could tie you in knots for one thing. He could judge you for another. You think you're trying to get him in knots and he ties you in knots by facing you with the truth. Well, having defended himself three times, he now goes round to the attack. The first attack he makes is on a spiritual basis and it's a bit complicated and it's a bit difficult for us to understand today. So uh, don't mind if you don't get much from this one, but let me explain what he means. He attacks their idea of the Christ or the Messiah or the Savior they're expecting. They are expecting a purely human figure from the line of David, a descendant of David, and they keep calling him the son of David. They called him that on the day, Palm Sunday. And Jesus says, I challenge you on this idea you have. You are looking for a purely human descendant of David to come and reign over you. 
I challenge you to look at what David himself said about this Christ who was coming. Do you notice Jesus is saying that David applied the same word to this Christ coming as you apply to God, the word Lord? In other words, David knew that the Christ who would come would be far more than a human being, would be a divine being. And so our Lord attacks their idea of the Christ. All they want is a political messiah, a leader, an agitator, a resistance leader, an insurrectionist. And Palm Sunday showed that so clearly. But Jesus says, I challenge you to think again. You ought to be looking as David did for a divine person, someone you could call Lord. Someone who is in fact far higher than David. Now it was always considered in those days that a descendant of someone was lower. That in a sense a grandfather was superior to both father and son. Jesus is saying in fact the one who's going to come is far above David. Far above. And David said he will put all his enemies under his feet. But it's Lord, Lord, not just a son of David. Now that was a technical point, but it was an important point in the light of Palm Sunday and Jesus was attacking them and their understanding of scripture. One little point before I, I leave that little section. Do you notice in verse 36, our Lord's view of the Psalms? David wrote them, but the Holy Spirit inspired them and therefore they could be appealed to as truth and as proof of truth. Now Jesus uh, knows that the common people are enjoying all this. There's nothing a crowd likes more than seeing hecklers put in their place. That's why Donald Soper uh, has such a following in Hyde Park Corner. It's the cheapest entertainment in London, as someone said to me. It's fascinating to watch him tying um, a heckler up into knots. And uh, these hecklers come up brashly and try and catch him out, and he seems just to be able to tie them up. There's only been one occasion when he was stuck for an answer and um, well, I'll tell you about that afterwards if you want to know. But on other occasions he's always known the right answer and it's very interesting to see uh, a heckler really sort of put in his place by a brilliant speaker in dialectic, in um, argument. Well now the crowd at the end of verse 37, they're enjoying this tremendously. The great throng heard him gladly. Jesus is only too aware of this. And so he now warns them in verse 38. And he moves now to an ecclesiastical question. And he says, beware. Beware. Of what? Of being in religion for what you get out of it. Of covering up greed pride and hypocrisy with religion. And he now says some very severe words which I find terribly disturbing and challenging. Those of us who have been called to full-time Christian service need to read this again and again and examine our own hearts. But I think all Christians need to. First of all, they were getting prestige out of it. And that's a most subtle thing. They liked wearing long robes. Well, that, of course, made them distinctive anyway and different from others. But long robes, you can't do any manual work in them and you can't hurry in them. And it gave the impression of a leisured scholar. They loved special greetings. Greetings like Father. And Jesus said, don't let anybody call you Father. Incidentally, um, I found out too late after three years in the services that Padre, of course, is precisely that. It's, uh, fr it came from the Italian army originally and it was the, simply the father put into Italian for the priest. Papa, Pope, it's the same word. Jesus said, don't let anybody call you father. Don't let anybody call you master. These are terms that imply you are above them and this is something you are not. They loved titles. They also loved the chief seats. And if there was a feast, they liked uh, the best room in the house where they were staying. 
Now they were in it for prestige. The second thing that they were in it for was greed. Now widows formed easy prey because they had no man to defend them and no man to argue for them. And I have noticed again and again how often cults and sects get hold of women and persuade them to accept their strange teachings, especially if there is no man to argue with the man who's come to the door. And the scribes did this, and they not only got these women uh, with them, they also took their money from them. And I'm afraid there's only too much evidence that many widows lost their money to such people. It was going on all the time. And Jesus said, and the trouble is, they cover it all up, all this greed, all this pride, all this desire for prestige and wealth, they cover it up with long prayers. find it very interesting that Jesus didn't like long prayers. He, he mentions this so often. If there's one thing kills a prayer meeting, it's long prayers. Mind you, he could spend all night in prayer privately, but he was thinking of public prayer. It's very interesting that the Book of Common Prayer, which is a lovely book, the more I study it, the more I feel it's a wonderful book of devotion. The collect was quite deliberately made a prayer of two or three sentences because it was meant to be common prayer, prayer that people could follow. And I suppose if we were all honest, if a prayer is too long in a prayer meeting or in church, we start thinking of other things only too easily. And Jesus said, these people covered it up with long prayers. They were professional prayers. And he said, because of their privilege, because of their responsibility, because of their position, they would receive a greater condemnation. I think that's an awful attack on professional religious people. And those of us who are called, as I've said, to full-time service need to examine our hearts all the time lest we ever begin to be greedy for prestige or to be thought highly of by others. But it's a warning that our Lord gives to all the people and so it's relevant to all Christians. Now like a breath of fresh air we come to the loveliest little story. It really is. Time for the collection. And our Lord sat down and watched the collection. Now they had trumpet, big trumpets set up on end at the gate into the treasury and as you went in you threw in your money. Usually made a nice ding <laughs> as it went in. I was in the Albert Hall recently in a, for a Christian meeting and the American chairman of it said, uh, well now friends, he said, we're going to have a silent collection tonight. I thought, now what is that? And then he pulled out a dollar bill out of his pocket and he said, paper only. <laughs> so a silent collection. But uh, they didn't have silent collections in the treasury. And the bigger the coin, of course, the bigger the ding it made as it went into this trumpet. And so, of course, you threw in the, the big coins and you made a nice ding. Um, there may be some connection here with uh, blowing your own trumpet. You know, when you give arms, blowing a trumpet before you. But in fact, they probably did, in fact, blow trumpets as well. But certainly these big trumpet receptacles, you can see the kind of thing, can't you? And you tossed your money in as ostentatiously as possible if you wanted to. That's why Jesus said, when you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand does. I've often how, wondered how Jesus knew there were two mites, but you know they would only make a tiny little ping. Do you realize that? And he sat over against these trumpets. And this poor little woman came along, looking as if she couldn't rub two farthings together. She could, in fact, but that was all. And she just put two little pings in. It's a most dramatic scene. And you know, it comes like a breath of fresh air after all this fight. Because for the first time you catch a glimpse of real religion. For the first time you catch a glimpse of someone who loves God with all they've got. That's why it's put in here. Sure, that's why the Holy Spirit wanted it in Mark's Gospel. Do you know that this is the last incident in the public life of Christ? His public life finishes on this note. Of a poor woman giving everything she's got to God. That's a lovely finish to the public ministry of Jesus. It's real religion. It tells us this, 
that when Christ looks into the collection, he doesn't ask what will that gift buy, but what did it cost? And that's a very different way of adding up the collection. Of course, we can't announce in the weekly bulletin what last week's offering cost. We can announce what it will buy. We can say how much was given. And we know roughly from that what that will buy, what it will get. We just can't write down in the bulletin what last week's offering cost. It may have cost some very little. It may have cost some a great deal. But in God's weekly bulletin, what goes down is what the offering cost, not what it amounted to. Or can I put it this way? He looks not at what was put in, but what was kept back. How much was still left in the wallet? This is how he counts it. And you notice that Jesus called his disciples together and he said, now look, I'm going to tell you something now. Did you see that little woman come up now? Did you see her go through into the temple? Tell you something about her. She has given more to God this day than anybody else in the temple. I've no doubt they must have looked at her and thought she's one of those, you know, has a mattress stacked with thousands of pounds for the Lord to talk like that and she's just one who doesn't spend it on herself. But no, he went on and he said she kept absolutely nothing back. Nothing. That's an amazing gift, especially when you have so little. And he then said this. He said, you see, all the other people that I've watched today who came to church and threw their collection in, gave from what was left over. That's the literal meaning of the word. They gave from what was left over. She has given all that was left. I think I've told you about the... Uh, lady who came up to uh, Dr. Joseph Parker in the city temple and gave him a pound note and said the widow's mite, Dr. Parker, and he said, but madam, the widow gave two mites. And she looked a bit shaken, but gave him another pound note. And then he said, but madam, the widow gave all that she had, at which she turned round and stalked out of the church. <laughs> he was just reminding her not to put herself on a level with this woman unless it was right to do so. Now, we are not saying that it is therefore right for every widow to go away and give away all that they've got. What he is saying is this. Here is real religion. Here's a woman who loves the Lord so much. She doesn't count the cost. She just says, Lord, you can have all that I've got. And the way to apply this to ourselves is not necessarily to go away and draw out all our bank balance and get rid of it or put it in the collection next Sunday. It is to go home and say, Lord, do you have all that I've got? There are different ways of giving all that you've got. That was her way. There are other ways of doing this, and other lovelier ways, lovely ways as well. So she put in everything. Well, now, what's my conclusion from the Bible study tonight? I'm sure you know all this like the back of your hand, you've known these stories, you've been through them before. Maybe something fresh has come to you tonight, but this was the first round in the battle that was to finish with what they thought was a knockout blow when they crucified Christ. It was largely a kind of sparring round in which they were getting the measure of each other. But the two things that I'm left with are these, they're really one. That if we think we are testing Jesus and testing Christianity with all our questions and with all our puzzles and so on, we shall very quickly find that sooner or later it's Jesus who is testing us. And the thing is reversed. I've known this happen so often, people who were argumentative and tried to argue about the miracles of the Bible and you don't still believe this and this, that and the other and they were trying to discredit the word of God. If they go on doing that, there will come a point where the word of God will begin to discredit them. It, it kind of rebounds on us. We can criticize the Bible and then sometime we find the Bible criticizing us. We can say things about Christ that we don't like. Sooner or later, Christ will tell us something in our lives that he doesn't like. 
And the thing that strikes me about this chapter is this. Christ had a way of stripping off what hid real people from others. And he could do it both ways. He could look at those public figures who were pretending to be religious and he could strip it all away and say, look at them. Greedy, proud people, hypocrites. And he could say that about us. And he could look at a simple, unnoticed little woman and say, isn't she wonderful? And he could immortalize such a person. By the way, we haven't even got her name. And yet she's still talked about by millions of people 2,000 years later. Isn't that amazing? And you know, perhaps she never knew. Perhaps she never knew. There is coming a day when God will judge the world by a man, Christ Jesus. And Jesus will say about everybody in the world what he said about people here. About some people he will say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, you used my name, but I never knew you. It was all pretense, it was all long prayers, it was all outward religion but it wasn't love for me. And then of some simple people whom the world will have forgotten, if the world ever thought of them, and Jesus will say, now look at this person. This person loved me so much. They're so important to me. There'll be such a reversal. Many that are first will be last. Many that are last will be first. But of course you realize that people who don't like being shown up will not like Jesus. And that's why this argument led to the cross. That's why within three days they were planning his death, crucifying him. Because a man who comes to me and says, your life is hypocrisy, it's religious on the outside, but it's dirty on the inside, that man I will not like. That man I will want to get rid of. That man I will want to put out of my life. And that's precisely what happened. And the cross, the shadow of the cross already began to fall across the scene. Tomorrow night we'll continue and look at to 13 together.